to wonder I got a gypsy in my soul Though something's calling me Way out yonder It's just this gypsy in my soul I hope you'll stay with us for the next 50 minutes and meet my guests Paul Daniels, the stylistics and of course the Jeff Richard dancers I'm thunder I've got this gypsy in my soul Do you know, I've often thought I'd like to be a gypsy. Do nothing but read fortunes all day and dance round a campfire all night and eat hedgehogs. <laughs> <laughs> well, it beats housework. Do you know why I hate housework? I'm just not domesticated. I've had this phobia ever since I fell off a ladder ironing in my curtains. <laughs> <laughs> and our first row was over this silly pair of socks. I know I'd put too much starch in them and they'd broken up whilst he was running for a bus. <laughs> and I'm a terrible cook. Oh, what a cook. When they came to convert us to North Sea Gas, they took the cooker away. It had been gone for three days before I noticed it were missing. <laughs> I wouldn't have realised then, but I went to lean on it and fell over. <laughs> oh, when I make a curry, Indian families sell up and move out. <laughs> I even cry when I'm peeling potatoes. <laughs> Oh, the first time I ever made a loaf of bread, my husband threw bits of it on the garden to keep the birds off. <laughs> He's always criticising my cooking. Oh, last night he did nothing but moan about his dinner. Said his porridge was cold, his crisps were soggy and that I'd burnt his Mars bar. <laughs> well, look, I get no encouragement from the kids. I mean, most kids collect pictures of Johnny Rotten or David Bowie. Mine have got pictures of Fanny Craddock. <laughs> they must be the only kids in Britain with A-levels for eating school dinners. <laughs> I'm not very good with kids. When I had my first, the matron came up to me and said, Now then, mother, would you like to change baby? And I said, Yes, please, I'll have a record player. <laughs> oh, no, it's beginning to affect my marriage. It is, I mean, I knew the magic had gone when he started drawing moustaches on my wedding photos, but it's my own fault, really, because I'm not very sexy. Terrible admission, but the last time I slipped into something soft and mysterious was when I fell in the cat's dinner. <laughs> well, I've made the odd token effort. You know, like, I once opened the door to him wearing black suspenders over my jeans. And, <laughs> and last Christmas, I, uh, I bought myself one of them shorty nighties. <laughs> Ridiculous, all your vest hangs out. <laughs> Mind you, he's not perfect. Oh, he's by no means perfect. Do you know what he sent me for Mother's Day? His mother. <laughs> when friends want to laugh, they come round and ask him to try one of last year's suits on. <laughs> I'm thinking of letting the trousers out. There's a block of flats. Anyway, 
<laughs> no, he's not the man I married. If only he knew what I was thinking about him sometimes. So we're alone again tonight. I read a book, you watch the fight. A stifled yawn, a can of beer. What an enthralling atmosphere. And yet the sight of us this way helps me to say what I must say. Helps me to think a thought or two and pass it right along to you. And just for starters, you should know, I think you've let yourself go. Down through the years, each sage repeats, grass never grows on busy streets, which might explain that balding spot. Were you a thinker, which you're not? And where's that slender youth I knew? I fear he's grown an inch or two, not up and down my joy and pride. But more precisely, side to side. When at a party now and then, you tell the same old jokes again, or wear a lampshade for a hat. Now, who could be wittier than that? With one too many, you just might pick some unnecessary fight. Though in the morning with the sun, you can't remember what you've done. If there's regret, it doesn't show. You know, you've let yourself go. You never care the way you dress. You stay unshaven, you look a mess. The smallest thing's too much to do. I even hold the door for you. And every rose upon the shelf is one that I've supplied myself. It's not the same, I'm well aware. Yet I still need to see them there I couldn't hate you if I tried And I still need you by my side We ought to lay things on the line Perhaps the fault is really mine And if it is, please tell me so The seed we planted still can grow Maybe that's all we need to know. Come close to me and let yourself go. Come in. No. Pardon? Well, why not? I don't like to. I feel such a fool. <laughs> Don't be silly. There's nothing to be nervous about. You are the marriage guidance counsellor. Yes, I am. Well, I'll come in on one condition. What's that? Promise not to laugh. All right. I promise not to laugh. <laughs> You're not laughing, are you? Uh, definitely not. Oh. Only I thought I saw the corners of your mouth move. No, <laughs> it's a trick of the light. Oh. Uh, uh, please, please do sit down. Thank you. <laughs> uh, now tell me, exactly how long have you been married? An hour and a half. <laughs> and you're here already? Well, I didn't have far to come. You can see the church from my window. St. Mary's lovely uh, service. No, no, no. I mean, I don't expect to see somebody in here an hour and a half after their wedding. What's brought you here? Well, it's difficult to know where to begin. I suppose it all started with the argument. The argument? Yes. Well, Charles, that's my husband, refused to have it seen to. Now, I said that he should, and I thought that he would, and then I found out that he hadn't. And that upset you? Well, of course it upset me. I said to him, I'm not going on any honeymoon until you've had it seen to. <laughs> and then when I found out that he hadn't, well, we had this... Uh... Uh, contretemps? Eh? <laughs> Disagreement. Oh. Oh, well, I wouldn't call it that exactly. And what would you call it? A flaming great row. <laughs> uh, when was this? At the reception. And then what happened? Well, uh, he started drinking. <laughs> People do tend to drink at wedding receptions. Not straight from the barrel. <laughs> See? Is drinking a problem for your husband? No, no, no. Drinking's not the problem. Oh, good. It's stopping. <laughs> See? 
And then what happened? Well, being very soft-hearted, I allowed him to talk me around, but only on the understanding that he got it looked at as soon as we got to St Ives. You know a good man in St Ives you can trust, do you? Well, anybody could stop it in a couple of hours with a monkey wrench. Stop what? <laughs> his big end. His what? <laughs> His big end and his exhaust hangs down so far it scrapes the floor. <laughs> and I'm not too sure about his brakes. <laughs> oh, I see. Well, yes, I do agree. It does seem rather risky going all the way to Cornwall in a car like that. Yes, especially with the dodgy big end. And that's another thing. What is? Well, he wasn't going to let me drive and then suddenly he changed his mind. When was that? Just after we'd cut the cake. Uh -huh. he, he must have been feeling rather romantic. No, not really. He passed out. <laughs> Now, that's why we had the accident. Accident? Yes. You need an AA man, not a marriage guidance counsellor. You see, as I was driving to my parents' house to change, I skidded on the wet road into this parked car. Now, that's when my husband woke up and the language... Look, madam, what? I'm very sorry that you're going through a difficult time, but I, I don't honestly know what I can do to help save your marriage. Save it? <laughs> what do you mean, save it? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with my marriage. No, nothing wrong with your marriage? No. <laughs> then why have you been wasting my time with all this talk about rows and drunkenness? Well, I, I just thought you might like to know about the blue marina parked outside with the marriage guidance sticker on the windscreen. Yes, that's my car. The, the two-seater. It's not a two-seater. It is now. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Look. Oh. To introduce my first guest, who is a very, very clever magician. Have you ever thought of the advantages of being a magician? It's the only job where your wife doesn't get suspicious if she finds evidence of other birds in your pocket. <laughs> now, he describes himself as an unusualist, but tonight he's going to do the usual and delight and amaze you. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr Paul Daniels. <laughs> Good evening to you. And actually, here is the news. Now, this is a most unusual news because I'm an unusualist, you see? Oh, you've got that. Good. Now, what we have been asked by the Japanese government is to solve their drought problem. Now, you didn't know that, did you? They have a drought problem every year. And um, British science has come up with an answer to it. It is not electronic water. No, it is much better than that. What they've decided that every morning people stand reading the Japan Times. Now, the Japan Times is, um, is printed for the Japanese. You see? You understand that. Of course you do. And um, what they've decided is as the commuters are standing there waiting for the buses, like this, you see, sort of waiting for a bus, a Japanese bus, and what they do is, if they stand like that and read the paper like that, when it rains, when you get a little shower, we wish we'll have a little shower in here, you see, when it, when it rains, if the water was collected in all the newspapers, you see, like that, that would be useful. And you could actually, oh, well, I'll show you, um, preserve it till you get home at night. Well, that was the theory, but then the Japanese have pointed out to the British scientists that their papers are not written this way on. Some of them are read this way on, you see, and certain dialects of the Japanese language are in fact read like this. Now, well, you can see the problem, of course you can, and British science has decided to work on it very much indeed, and so it's more or less a write off but not completely. You see, what is this, the Japanese have decided is that um, they quite like it. Not a lot, but they like it. Oh, dear. You're a lovely audience. It's a shame, really, because the rest of this act is rubbish. <laughs> Actually, it's a bit lonely up here. I'm supposed to have an assistant, but, um, you know, BBC cuts. Not allowed, apparently. <laughs> now, this is a balloon. <laughs> You're OK, Marty. I've got a balloon. I do not need two more. Now, what is we're going to do... <laughs> Where did you get that? <laughs> this looks like Ken Dodd in drag. <laughs> <laughs> by Joe, by Joe. Now, what have you got there? Now, you've got the needle, OK? Thank you. Don't handle the props. You pick that up, all right? Just stand and look glamorous and don't handle the props. It's going to be difficult. And it's one, two, three, and through, and through, and there is the balloon absolutely pierced and in one piece. Now, if you could tidy that up, that isn't that good? OK, there you go. Marvellous. Happy? Yeah. OK. Hold something. 
Well, not with your fingers stuck out. You see, this... Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I got carried away because I keep getting interrupted. Now, these two handkerchiefs here, and what we're going to do with the two handkerchiefs is, in fact, the, <laughs> is the, the world's oldest trick, uh, one of the world's oldest tricks, and despite being the world's oldest trick, it is actually called... <laughs> the, um... <laughs> it's actually called the, um... By Jove, I'll have two big round bruises in the middle of my back. <laughs> it is actually... Where have you gone? Oh, there you are. Now, just, just keep hold of the silks, all right? Now, this silk handkerchief here is going to disappear, very carefully disappear. All right, you've seen a magician's assistant. What is going to happen is I'm going to put on top of this a little bit of offal dust. Now, this, where is it? There it is, offal dust. Don't play with the props, OK? Just stand still, don't play with the props. Now, this stuff dissolves silk handkerchiefs beautifully, and the silk reappears tied between the other two silks. OK? Yeah, look. <laughs> Marty, what are you doing? That, that's, that's a sock, Marty. That's a sock. That, that's my sock. <laughs> Marty. Oh, no. Sorry. You see, I don't normally have these problems. Um, the next trick I, I think you will like. Not a lot, but you'll like it. And um, you're in the way, Marty. And if you could just... I'd like you to have a look at this. This is a... If you're not careful, Marty, you'll get plucked. And now this is... A, this... Plucked. Now this is, this, is, this is a stand, and this, of course, is a little box into which the dice... fits. Don't play with the props, OK? Now, we should place the dice in there very carefully, all right? What have you done to the box, Marty? Look, you're messing all my props up. Oh, it's a good, very tight fit. Now, I'm going to place this on the stand like so, so you can see it. it's in the box. Now, will you stop faffing at me? And I'm going to place this on here. Now, you can see that it... it, it doesn't go in. Um, you can see that. Um, you've played with these props, haven't you? I know you have. It went in before. Now, what I'm going to do now, ladies and gentlemen, is something completely different. I've decided to make the actual dice disappear. On the... <laughs> do not play with the props. Now, what have you done? Look at the shape of that. What is the use of that? <laughs> I can't do tricks with that. <laughs> the temptation. An idea occurs to me. I have a trick that you can help with. You like this. Not a lot, but you like it. Come over here, you turquoise palm tree, and watch this very carefully. Not too close, I could get to like it. Now, what I want you to do is just um, back both of them away a little, and I will, um, I'll show you something rather strange. Now, I want you to put in there three pieces of potato. This device is a French invention. It is known as a guillotine, and the guillotine and the third piece. You see how beautifully you did it. <laughs> the guillotine is cured, cured many headaches, but this is a special guillotine. The blade will pass through this particular chip without cutting it at all. All right? A one, two, three. And... <laughs> Marty, look, you've kicked the damn thing. You've ruined it. I'm, I'm awfully sorry about this, ladies and gentlemen. I, I'm, you can appreciate I'm, I'm getting a bit nervous. If you could just, um, just put three more pieces of potato in, we, we will try again. Now, this time, ladies and gentlemen, three I've only got two. You've only got two, yes. I've been mentioning them all throughout. <laughs> um, oh, two little ones, yes. If you could just, if you could just put them I in there, Marty, I, a thought occurs to me. If we've only got two, perhaps you'd like to put something else in here. Yes? Just... Yes, your head. Just rest your head in there, Marty. Now, now don't, don't be chicken, despite the feathers. Now, just, come on, get it in there. Now, now, forward a bit. Oh, you've got a use at last. You dust the prop. Now, that's fun. Got a band with a funny sense of humour. Now, this... <laughs> That's almost perfect, Marty. Would you now just rest your hands round the front, like that, then you can wave at your head as it goes past. And... <laughs> if you could sort of, you know, those things, legs, yes. If you could keep them nice and stiff, because they go that way afterwards anyway, OK? <laughs> and, um, and, uh, Oi! What? Don't play with the props. <laughs> <laughs> it was a thought. Um, it was a thought. 
So I shall restrain myself, and at last you come in useful, Marty. Okay? Might I just say before you go where you might be going that um, it's been a pleasure appearing on the first part of your show because it rather looks as though there may not be any more of it. This thing has gone very badly wrong twice. Now, if you could just keep your head very still, you'll feel a sharp numbing sensation, but don't worry, this soon drops off. Okay? <laughs> Cut along the dotted line. One, two, three, and... Marty, I want you to do me one last favour, you know? As you go through your show, meeting all your friends, don't nod to any one of them, okay? <laughs> I'm waiting to see my bank manager. Oh, and I love being in a bank. It's that warm smell of wall-to-wall -wall money. <laughs> no, men say that we women don't understand money, and it's not just the wee women, but the tall ones like me as well. <laughs> Let's go and see what he wants. Right. Sorry to keep you waiting, Mrs. Ken. Now, we seem to have a little problem. You can tell me all about it. You find me very discreet. A financial problem. Oh, you have my sympathy. Do you know I bought a joint of beef last week? Now, I don't exaggerate. It was no bigger round than that ashtray and about as Mrs. tender Mrs. Kane, as... the financial problem to which I'm referring is yours. 
Frankly, I'm rather concerned. Oh, that's very sweet of you. But you mustn't be concerned on my account. I've learned to live with it. Hardly give it a thought. <laughs> so I've noticed. Do you happen to have your checkbook with you by any chance? Oh, of course. I wouldn't dream of going anywhere without it. I always use it. That's something else I've noticed. May I see it, please? But of course. Although you must have seen hundreds. Probably thousands. <laughs> now, let's see. Suntan lotion? <laughs> Chilblain cream? Isn't the weather changeable? <laughs> Ammonia spray in case I'm molested. <laughs> Chanel number five in case I'm not. <laughs> oh, yes. Here we are. I'm so glad. Now, I have some of your old checks here. Perhaps we could look through them together. That sounds very cosy. Do you know, you look much better in the flesh than you do in your letters. I'm sorry? Well, I thought you'd be a little titchy man with a baldy head. <laughs> yes, if we could just get back to your checks, Mrs. Kane. Beautifully written, aren't they? I beg your pardon? I said beautifully written. Do you know, handwriting was my best subject at school. My English teacher said he'd never seen a 16-year-old with such beautiful loops and squirrels. Really? <laughs> what was your arithmetic like? Well, I was very good at timeses and share buys. Share buys? Yes, in twos. In twos? Yes, you know, 9 into 25 goes 3, carry 2, and all that. <laughs> you must have done them. Yeah, you're not quite like that, I'm afraid. How was your subtraction? Sub what? Oh, sorry, takeaways. Oh. <laughs> I was useless at takeaways. I think my mother must have been frightened by a Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I suppose that could explain the terrible state of your account. I wonder if you'd tell me something about this particular cheque for £75 at Harrods. Oh, now that was for the most beautiful pale tan chiffon dress you have ever seen. You'd love me in it. It has little seed pearls down here and the waist goes into tucks into a panel at the back that sort of flows. Yes, when you... just you... why? Why did you need a 75 pound chiffon dress in the middle of January? Oh, to go with the new shoes, of course. What new shoes? The ones I bought in the winter sales. Mm. Which, of course, you just had to have. Yes, to go with the handbag. The what? The handbag. I bought it with that cheque you're holding now. Pay Christian Dior 45 pounds? Sounds a lot when you say it. <laughs> it sounds a lot when anybody says it, Mrs. Kane. <laughs> ah, but you're forgetting the money that I saved. Oh, what money was that, pray? By not buying the fox fur jacket. Do you know, they wanted 450 pounds for it. But I was firm with myself. I just told them I couldn't afford it. Yes, I congratulate you on your iron willpower. So you see, although I spent £30 on a pair of shoes and £45 on a handbag and £75 for a chiffon dress, by not buying the fur jacket, I actually saved £300. <laughs> Mrs. Kane, the more I listen to you, the more I'm convinced that you're a natural Chancellor of the Exchequer. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't have the eyebrows for it. <laughs> <laughs> Just how long have you been banking with us, Mrs. Kane? Uh, about 11 years. 11 years? <laughs> Is there anything wrong with that? No, 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 no. In principle, we're in favour of you banking with us. What we have to try to avoid, however, is us banking with you. <laughs> oh, I don't know. It sounds like a lovely idea to me. <laughs> Mrs. Kane, in plain terms, I have to tell you that you are overdrawn to the extent of £32.70. p. In even plainer terms, £32.70 is the amount you owe the bank. Now, why didn't you say so in the uh. first place? Who do I make this cheque out? Oh. <laughs> Big and bright, it's a supernatural delight. Everybody's dancing in the moonlight. Everybody here is out of sight. They don't bark and they don't bite. They keep things loose, they keep things light. Everybody's dancing in the moonlight. Dancing in the moonlight, everybody's feeling. Dance, dance, little lady, dance. 
got fun. Not much money, oh, but honey, ain't we got fun? There's nothing sure. The rich get rich and the poor get poor. Must you dance every dance with the same fortunate girl? You have danced with her since the music began. Won't you change partners and dance with me? You've been locked in her arms ever since. Heaven knows where Won't you change partners and then You may never want to change partners again Everybody was dancing in the moonlight, dancing in the moonlight, dancing in the moonlight. Oh, thank you. Ooh. I really enjoyed that. Took me right back to my Locarno days. Do you remember the over 21 nights you used to go to when you were under 16? <laughs> <laughs> Just to watch the groups. Mind you, ours was a very poor neighborhood. We uh, only had a three piece group piano, stool, and player. <laughs> <laughs> and we all used to be lined up against the walls waiting for young men to come and ask us to dance. I think I may have been a little bit over eager. I was the only one crouched in starting blocks. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, well, I had to, you know, I, I had very prominent teeth in those days. I used to have to wear braces and a belt. <laughs> <laughs> so to sort of overcompensate for it, I, I used to paint those beauty spots on my face. And I figured, you know, being young, that the more spots are painted, the more alluring I became. It worked as well. I was followed all the way home one night by three Dalmatians and... Uh, <laughs> And then there was a mascara, do you remember, used to pile it on ever so thick. I used to put mine on so thickly that Roy Orbison fans used to ask for my autograph. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and that, well, you had to look your best, you see, to compete with that girl. Now you've seen her. She used to glide into every dance hall wearing that very tight, slinky dress. Used to look like a ferret chasing a dozen rabbits round a polythene bag. <laughs> Or sometimes she'd arrive in a mini dress so high that if she'd have been in Egypt, it'd have been called a yashmak. <laughs> I tried to copy her one night, you know, but with my legs, I looked like a wishbone with a fringe. <laughs> so consequently, when, you know, when the fellas got together and used to say, I don't fancy yours, well, I used to be yours. <laughs> Mind you, she was anybody's. But do you know? <laughs> I was very thin in those days, unlike now, and... Uh, <laughs> Do you know, I remember saving up for about six weeks for this see-through dress. <laughs> Looked like a 13-amp fuse. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's funny because on the occasions that I did get a fella, you could bet your life it'd be little. Consequently, I used to lead because he couldn't see where he was going. <laughs> He was more interested in going where he was seen, actually. <laughs> Lecherous beast. <laughs> Bless him. But do you know, <laughs> like a lot of you ladies here tonight, I met my husband in a dance hall. Oh, he was wonderful. A sort of cross between John Wayne and Lionel Blair. Unfortunately, he walked like Lionel Blair and danced like John Wayne. <laughs> You know, he didn't bore me with those old dance hall cliches like, darling, your dress is coming off. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. I've made my mind up. You know, none of that. <laughs> Instead, with a voice charged with emotion, he'd say, is anybody taking you home tonight? And I'd say, no. And he'd say, well, never mind. Better look next week. 
But they were definitely the good old days, weren't they? Not like today. Oh, I don't know how they cope with all these punk rockers. Oh, safety pins and pins everywhere. Look like refugees from a acupuncture clinic. <laughs> <laughs> But it's now time to introduce my next guests, who are five young men from Philadelphia whose records have topped the charts all over the world. It's a great pleasure to introduce the Stylistics. It's a medical dictionary. Now, if somebody buys you one for Christmas, take my advice, don't read it. If you do, you'll think you've got every disease under the sun. Of course, if I had any sense, I'd get rid of my copy, but that'd mean not going to the doctors anymore, and, well, he is rather good looking. In fact, I quite fancy him. <laughs> good morning, Mrs. Kane. Oh, I think it's wonderful the way you do that, Doctor. Do what? Remember who I am. It might be very difficult ever to forget you, Mrs. Kane. I think you spend more time in this surgery than I do. <laughs> it's been every Wednesday since I started practicing here a year ago. Well, if this is what you like when you're only practicing, what's it going to be like when you get to the real thing? <laughs> Mrs. Kane, this is the real thing. 
Oh, this is so sudden, Doctor. <laughs> no, 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 Mrs. Kane. Tell me, what do you think this is? A file? Not a file. Mrs. Kane, this is your file. <laughs> is this all me? All you. Oh. Everything from suspected tonsillitis to unconfirmed earaches and the phantom housewife's knee. Not to mention the case of the vanishing hernia. <laughs> Can I just sneak a quick look? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's completely out of the question. You see, a wise doctor never lets a patient look at his prognosis. Oh, I, I know that because you get reported to the BMA. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wondered what you'd said about me. M Mrs. Kane, please, I really am a very busy man. Could you just tell me what it is that's bothering you this time? Well, I just thought you'd like to examine me. Examine you for what? Well, I don't know. You're the doctor. You'll find something if you look hard enough. I'll just go behind the screens and get you. No, 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 no. That won't be necessary, Mrs. Kane. I was only trying to help. I know exactly what you were trying to do. But I have now examined you more than 150 times. 153, but who's counting? <laughs> I know your body better than I know my own. Doctor, I think you're being a little indelicate. Oh. <laughs> really, Mrs. Kane, you must understand that to a doctor, one human body is very much like another. Are you trying to tell me that if I stripped off alongside Cyril Smith, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course I would. I well, that's a relief, especially with the size of his majority. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. The reason why I'm not going to examine you is because I'm not going to find anything wrong with you. Well, how do you know until you've looked? I've looked, Mrs. Kane, I've looked. Do you remember the disc you thought you'd slipped? I hunted everywhere for that. <laughs> and that head cold that moved to your chest, then chilled your tummy, and finished up round your ankles? Or so you tried to tell me. I've really suffered, haven't I, Doctor? No, I've suffered. You've just complained. Please believe me, Mrs. Kane, you couldn't be healthier. You're as fit as a flea, you're as strong as a horse, and you've got the constitution of an elephant. I've been seeing the wrong man. I should have been going to a vet. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Kane, you're a hypochondriac. Ah, wrong. Sagittarian. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Kane, it's time you were made to realise there is absolutely nothing whatsoever wrong with you, and there never has been. It's all been in your mind. Now, is that clear? All in the mind, you say? All in the mind. So, I trust I won't be seeing you here again next Wednesday? Definitely not, Doctor. Oh, Good. I'm on holiday. See you Wednesday fortnight. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, meet my long-suffering doctor, played by Francis Matthews. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, you know, Marty, we've got to stop meeting like that. I keep having to take my own pulse. Well, we did arrange to stop seeing each other, Francis. We did? I don't remember that. <laughs> now, didn't I say... Hey, didn't you say... Didn't we say... Didn't, didn't who say? say... Didn't you say you were off to China? No, I didn't say that. Fancy meeting you here. Hey, didn't you just board an ocean liner? Rowing boat. Fancy meeting you here. Didn't we agree that our affair was too frantic? And we both feel good divided by the wide Atlantic. Tell me, weren't you yachting off to the Riviera? No, the Isle of Wight. Fancy meeting you here. And was it jolly roaming the Sahara? Oh, that sun gets everywhere. Fancy meeting you here. If you don't think I have missed your loving, let's get this clear, dear. I just think it's fancy meeting you right here. Now tell me, was it a rumor? Did I get a note from Madagascar? Fancy meeting you here. And didn't you say you enjoyed Alaska? Froze my acid. <laughs> fancy meeting you here. <laughs> Didn't we divide our little world in two sections? Well, we did, we did. But love has sure affected both our senses of direction. Tell me something, how did you ever get rid of that big, fat, wealthy person? It wasn't easy. Fancy meeting you here. Did 
Did you come by a British Rail excursion? No, I missed the train again. Oh, you must have flew here. Flew here. If you don't think it's a kick to see it, let's get this clear. From the way my heart is wildly beating. What we had is more than worth repeating. And, and it's, it's more, more than, than fancy meeting you right here. And it's more than fancy meeting you right here. Start at the top, you're certain to drop. You gotta watch your timing. Better begin by climbing. Up, up, up the ladder. While you are young, take it rung after rung after rung. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. It's not how you go, it's how you land. That hundred to one shot, the one who's a klutz, can outrun the favorite. All he needs is the guts. Your final return will not diminish. And you can be the cream of the crop. It's not where you start, it's where you finish And you're gonna finish on top It's not where you start, it's, it's where, where you finish. finish It's not where you were, it's where it's you are where it's where you are. stuck in the mail room Just gathering moss Then pow! Comes the memo that you know the show and I'd like to thank my guests, the stylistics, Paul Daniels, Francis Matthews, Alan Cuthbertson, Raymond Mason and of course the Jeffrey Dancers. Good night.